Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. And boy, oh boy, do we have an incredible artist to talk about today. And this is an artist I've wanted to feature for a while. And um, the painting that I'm about to do is going to take several episodes. Oddly enough, this is what people have been asking for, for me to do a painting that takes longer than one episode. So we're going to do the full mural, or, or full canvas, I should say. That's that's also an important distinction. Uh, by Platila Nelly, uh, the greatest uh, uh, Florentine woman painter... Uh, and I would suggest one of the greatest Renaissance artists of all time. N hands down, um, over the past, just, okay, last night I spent, uh, I was up till three in the morning researching her, and I watched this documentary, I'll show you here in a moment here, three times in a row, standing in the middle of my living room, just like, how is she not literally on the tip of every person's tongue? Why, why, you know, she should absolutely be, be, you know, in the same sentence as Leonardo and Michelangelo. Um, yeah, I, it's the, an incredible story. I was so inspired that I was thinking, like, the whole time I'm, I'm watching this documentary, like, why is there not a movie? Why is there not books and everything I'm like maybe I gotta do something because this is just like uh, a, a bit of a historical um, black hole missing part that I think is a story absolutely necessary to be told so um, strap in this is gonna be a, a fantastic like a, a really interesting story here uh, and I just you know I, I did bring out uh, the, these recent works that I've done featuring Renaissance artists. We have Raphael here, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Leonardo, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And uh, I think Platilla Nelli should be the honorary fifth member of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So... <laughs> Uh, join me while we work on today's painting here. I'm going to move these out and I look forward to her um, joining this group of all-star artists. Okay. Whew. I'm so excited. I'm also a little bit overwhelmed by the task at hand, so uh, let's... <laughs> I'm not even sure why, why I'm, I'm doing this to myself, but I do want to mention here right off the top. So, um, this is something kind of relatively new if, you're, if you've been with the channel for a while. I want to introduce this idea of the scale of difficulty here for this painting. Uh, going from our absolute beginner, easiest paintings to our most complex paintings. And I think it should be uh, stated at, that... This is in no way a reflection of the quality or ability of the artists that we're studying from, the masters that we're looking at, um, because there's some of the greatest artists who've ever lived have created some of the paintings we've done as for our beginner level artworks. Um, so uh, this is just a reflection of how difficult it would be for for people like yourself watching to to execute today's painting. So I would probably put today's painting somewhere between three and four. Uh, I don't think it's quite as complex as the painting we made just yesterday or two days ago, the Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci. That I would put at our expert level. That one is, is I mean, it looks complicated, but it is way more complicated than I thought it would be. Um, so I would say that this is definitely 
in our intermediate or advanced category. So you're certainly welcome to, to attempt it, but uh, just be advised that it's a little bit of a, a, a hill. It's a mountain to climb for sure. So I also want to, to outline here the, the various different stages that we're going to um, go through. So we're going to begin here in a moment by talking about the materials that are required. Then we're going to do our image transfer and a staining of the painting with some color. We'll talk about Platila Nelli's biography and what is known about it. We'll do a little bit of underpainting. And probably today my goal is to get the first pass of background and foreground established. And I'm going to do all three sections of this painting. Um, I'm going to start them all at the same time. And then once they're started, um, I can, uh, my goal is to get into a stage where then I could work on one individually without, and, and kind of maybe finish that one and then move on to the other ones in separate episodes. I think that's my goal is to try to do that. So let's jump. Oh, you know what? Just before I do do that, uh, just as a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. That helps people like me a lot and it doesn't cost you a penny. But if you want to support the channel with a penny, you can donate that penny digitally versus via PayPal um, or send an e-transfer or check in the mail. Um, and the links to all those are down below. You can use the YouTube Super Chat, but YouTube takes 40% of whatever you donate. So not a great deal for, for me or you. I mean, it's nice for YouTube but they don't have to do a lot to get that, that money from you. So um, PayPal, I think they take like 1%, 1.2% of whatever you send, and e-transfer I think is $1 up front or something. So anyway, let's, um, let's go to our materials required here. So um, I'm not... Okay, so here I want to outline some of the basic materials that would be required to do a painting like today. We're obviously going to need some paint, we're going to need something to paint with, like a brush, and we're going to need some sort of a canvas to paint on. Now other things that might be useful would be like our glazing fluid for this painting, uh, some kind of a palette to put your, your paintings, your mix your paint on, etc and some carbon paper as you'll see here uh, optional things would be kind of nice you could use like a posca pen to do some of the the finer details i don't know if i'll do that myself but um and then obviously also having some sort of material to clean up your mess a few rags which are really helpful in case something bad should happen paint spilling on your floor or kitchen table etc uh, there's Furbate and Heidi and ABCD in the, in the uh, chat there. Good morning, everybody. So to the, the method I like to use to make a painting is what's called a split primary palette. I wish I knew about this 20 years ago or even longer when I was in high school. If I learned how to paint this way, my life probably would have been a lot different. That's why... I am making it sort of a bit of my mission to promote this method of painting because I think it's the by far the best way to learn how to paint and potentially even to use it as a professional artist as well. Um, so color, every color has a temperature and knowing what color is warm and cool is important because cool colors are generally placed in the background and warm colors in the foreground and when we use those colors in those particular ways we can create the illusion of depth um, there's lots of other ways to do that like perspective and layering objects using um, uh, 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 the value scale to modify paints using tints tones and shades uh, i mean the list goes on but uh, one way that you can do this is even if you're making an abstract painting is to put warm and cool colors in different places as uh, uh, you get this kind of push-pull effect as it's said um, 
Okay, so let's just look at the paints that you could use to execute today's painting. There's Asnul says, sup. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to use this particular brand of paint, this, these Amsterdam paints here. And I'm about to use this paint to stain the, the, the canvas here with my Aim Play Amateur, which will do... So this paint costs about $15 for a 250 milliliter tube. I encourage you to look around. If you can't find it for that price, look around. You should be able to find it for that price. Don't spend $25 on Amazon for it. A lot of stuff on Amazon is cheap, but not paint for whatever reason. I'm going to just flip through all these other brands that you could use. There is a, a handout in the Dropbox folder below. That link is there in the image description or video description. Uh, and it lists all these paints. And um, these are the, the kind of six plus black and white that I would recommend you buy if, you're, if you are going to use these various different brands to, to basically recreate what I'm going to be doing here on camera today. See, there's a long list. So you can use lots of different paint. You don't have to buy this particular paint. I'm not sponsored or paid by them. I haven't been given any free supplies or anything. No free vacations. Uh, I bought it just like everybody else, but this is what I recommend. I think the best bang for the buck. Uh, except these two brands here, Museum Color and Peebo, they put way too much titanium white in their paint as a filler, and that makes it impossible to mix the black as I like to do. Now, if you're going to be mixing a lot of grays, perfect. If you're really into pastel colors, perfect. But if you want to get more um, saturated, vibrant, intense colors, you might want to try a different brand than these ones, which is disappointing, especially in the case of Peebo, because they are one of the, the largest brands in the world. So the fact that they do that is, is um, very unfortunate, frankly. Uh, because I'm sure that causes painters, especially beginner painters who are buying this brand um, to get started. It causes, it's going to cause them all sorts of confusion why they can't do what we're doing here. So I want to try to uh, illuminate that. Okay, so our first step here is to do the image transfer. And this is going to be probably where I'm going to spend maybe the next 45 minutes of today's episode because I want to get the transfers for all three sections of this painting. Now, the original painting is one large canvas. Um, so, um, it, it doesn't, but I've broken it into three sections just so it fits nicely on three of these nine by 12 sized canvases. So let me just show you kind of, you know, as we lay this out, we'll come back to that in a second. So we have the center panel here with Jesus in the center here and Judas, the only one seated directly in front of the table here, right? They're both reaching for this wafer for the bread. Um, and the goal is <laughs> for me to figure how to do this so that I can get this background to repeat kind of continuously. That's what this is. So I had hoped to do this, what I'm about to do over the last few days so that I could just play this and skip ahead. But I got so worked up by her work I got so worked up by Platilla Nelly's work that um, I spent more time in sublime awe <laughs> of looking at her paintings that I didn't get a chance to actually do the work, which is not a bad thing to be dumbstruck by someone's art that it is um, 
Anyway, I feel super, super, super inspired today um, by her work and also a little bit overwhelmed by the task at hand. Uh, so, uh, okay. This one. This will be one of the the more challenging things I've I've done on this channel for sure. Um, I might move this down just a little bit. And. Let's go to three, I'm going to go to three and a half centimeters from the bottom. So one thing to kind of keep in mind or just know is that at least it's my printer doesn't necessarily, even though I've designed this to be perfectly straight level across. The printer itself, when paper goes in there, sometimes it doesn't print, you know, perfectly aligned to the dimensions of the paper. Too, is with these other panels um, you can see that like technically they are about like this where these these two guys their shoulders or elbows basically touch in the original painting I'm gonna move these this over um, so there's gonna be a little bit of a gap between them uh, just for the the sake of I kind of want to like if rather than have one painting that can exist on its own and then two paintings that require themselves to be jammed up next to the other one to work with lots of um, kind of empty space on the side I'm gonna kind of move both paintings a little bit off so there's a little gap in between here. I know that might seem kind of sacrilegious, to, and I don't mean any disrespect to you, Platilla. Um, but just for... Um, because I love this painting so much, I want... Um, uh, I want to treat it with as m the entire painting with as much reverence as I possibly can. And that for me means also kind of um, treating each of these sections as, as equally as, as possible here. Again, I hoped I was planning on doing this before today's episode aired, so I know this is probably not compelling uh, video, but this at least gets you to see in real time what a uh, process like this might entail.
Now, once I get this on, I'm probably still gonna make a line all the way across with my ruler, measure it out, but I just wanna see if I can get this aligned as closely as possible. You know, if I can do it right, right here, then I don't have, I'll have less issues later. In fact, I'm just gonna move that over to the left a bit. As they as um, they say in the carpentry world, measure twice, cut once, and Jesus was a carpenter, so um, the, it uh, makes some sense to <laughs> to use that hackneyed saying here for this particular occasion. Okay. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? You know, so when I, it's fun for me to, you know, I look at this and I've got three blank canvases with these images pasted on. I should also mention too that uh, these are all on, it's funny, some of these are going to be upside down, nine by 12 sized canvases. Let me see, how many of these... Oh, are they all going to be upside down? Hmm. That one's not. Am I tempted? No, I'm not tempted. I was like, should I, should I just untape these and get them all lined up on the back side? No. Um... I, I, I am a little bit anal retentive and OCD to some ex to some extent, but um, not to that extent. Okay, so the next thing I do is use some carbon paper, and you can see some of this has been used many times. I think I'm going to use a fresh sheet of carbon paper. You can see the difference between one sheet that's been used never and many times like something like this so you can use these sheets over and over and over and over again The reason I'm using a, a new sheet of carbon paper is hopefully that will help um, make it less, make, I, maybe even ideally if I can have strong outlines, it will mean maybe I could be able to, to skip the underpainting process altogether. That way I can see these lines coming through of at least a couple of layers of paint. Okay. Oh, there's Sandra. Sandra, I haven't seen you in the chat in a long time. Great to see you there. There's Judith says, do you paint with student quality paints? What is the difference? Um, yeah, well, I would consider these Amsterdam paints to be student quality. Um, so you have student quality versus, you know, quote-unquote artist quality, and which is intended to be, you know, like um, student quality. Like the Amsterdam paint that I'm going to use is considered student quality, um, meaning that it's not as is expensive and not as 
as the pigment concentration isn't as high and the quality of pigments might be a little bit lower. So is probably most likely all synthetic pigments as opposed to actual mineral or um, uh, or organic pigments. So they've all been synthesized in t test tubes and beakers and stuff. But um, I don't think that should stop you from even a professional artist from using so-called student-grade paint. Um, I think, you know, if you can afford it, sure. Why not? But one thing I find is that when people use more expensive paints, they become more worried about um, making mistakes. And if they do make mistakes, they're more likely to become despondent and give up halfway through. And um, I would like for people to, to paint with a little bit more freedom and, and joy and worry less about the outcome and more about the, the process, the journey along the way. So, um, that's why I'm a big believer in using this paint as a, uh, to, to make these paintings. And I think, you know, honestly, even if you do have the money to spend, I think, again, using these uh, a cheaper paint especially for when you're just getting started um, is it just a great idea because um, you know what happens is if you're painting with good paints and it's not turning out the way you want you can become kind of discouraged because you feel like you know what I spent you know there's there might be fifty dollars worth of paint in this painting or something and it's like ah it's like I just um, it's, I just got mugged on the subway or something or I feel like I'm angry that I've I've, you know, I've wasted time and money and versus if this painting let's say cost you five dollars worth of paint you know, and it doesn't turn out the way you want, you're like, well, that's a bummer. But, you know, it's like I just dropped my, went and got a coffee at Starbucks and I'm walking down the street and some kid on a skateboard flies by and, and I, you know, I'm wearing my headphones and I don't see them until just as they pass me and I, it freaks me out and I drop my coffee on the sidewalk. You know, that would be, that would be, you know, upsetting, but it uh, probably wouldn't ruin my day. But if I got mugged, and someone took 50 bucks from my pocket, I'd be pretty shaken up, <laughs> right? So, I don't know if this analogy works at all. Um... And it's like I remember one of my collectors said to me once, he's like, the wealthiest people are often the cheapest people <laughs> in the world. So even if you do have a lot of money, you're probably, you may be more likely than anybody to, uh, to feel... Um, angry at yourself for wasting money if you, the painting doesn't turn out so.
Because I think one thing I find like with with artists, like especially beginner artists, and I, like I remember when I was beginning, um, when I, when I first started art school. You know, you go to the art supply store, and you can't help but feel desirous of the the most expensive paint on the shelves, and you're like, oh, one day I'm going to use them, and it will make my paintings ten times better. Good paint isn't going to make a bad painting any better. Um, you can paint a masterpiece with bad paint. In fact, another, uh, the, kind of the perfect example of this, is Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Obviously, you know, one of the most famous paintings in human history. Certainly more famous than Plotilla Nelli's Last Supper. But that painting was falling off the wall while Leonardo was painting it because he was using an experimental paint um, that he was develop he had developed uh, because of course he did <laughs> you know he was kind of a an inventor and so you know but we remember that painting for the, its beauty not because of how um, poorly made those paints are. In fact, one might even say that the fact that that painting is in such poor condition is one of the things that makes it so enigmatic. So I'm just kind of showing you what this panel looks like as I go forward here. I'm not doing every line, especially in the hair and beards and stuff like that. You know, I should, I should share with you this documentary right now, and then if you want to watch that and then come back to see me, um, that might be a great use, better use of your time than watching me do this. Let me show you this. This 26-minute documentary on Platilinelli and this painting in particular is... I don't, it must have won some award. Like, I, I don't, usually they would say something, you know, nominated for an Academy Award or something. Man, this documentary totally moved me. Like, as I said, I watched this four times in a row, twice this morning, two times last night. I was standing in the middle of the living room looking at the TV like this. Like, are you kidding me? What? So... You know, this is, I mean, I, I love the company. I thank, thank all of those of you who are watching right now. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, if, if you want to feel inspired and then a little bit angry as to, wait a second, why is Platilinelli not one of the top five most famous celebrated artists of all time. Why is she not seen, art, I mean, based on that as probably one of the greatest women who's ever lived? I don't know. I've, I've never heard her name come up in conversations like that before. But you watch that documentary and I think you might come away thinking this is almost like a, a tragedy. I mean, it's almost, I'm not a conspiracy minded person, but you just go like, is, is the, the reason why this, this woman, like, how is it possible that 500, 450 years or so have passed since she was here on earth 
and she's only now being sort of um, rediscovered like your guess is as good as mine well I mean there's obviously um, lots of reasons for that which we'll get into um, and all of the obvious reasons The same old, same old reasons, which is why it gives me faith that we're moving in the right direction as a human race. Um, that. We're, fi we're kind of really finding out about some of the great artists in the past who've been overlooked just because of their gender, which is like just a almost unbearable tragedy, honestly. But, you know, and this, I feel like that's part of my role here is to try to highlight artists, you know, some very famous artists, and then artists like Platilla, who, I don't know, maybe I just missed that day of art history class, but I don't remember anybody ever talking about her before. And when you see her work, as we will look at here a little bit more closely, it's just mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. And the fact that she's completely self-taught is dumbfounding. Like, uh, how did this woman teach herself how to paint, um, at this level? It's just like, what on, how on earth? Mind-boggling. That's the only way to, to, to describe this. Okay. <laughs> Look at these feet there. Well, can't really see on camera very well, but... They look like space alien toes or something. So I'm mostly just trying to, trying to get the basic structures on here.
Okay, so I was just carrying over these lines of the table onto this other canvas here. As I said, this is not going to make for particularly compelling entertainment here, my apologies. But, uh, this is a bit of a labor of love, for sure. And as I said, I don't expect anybody to watch a single minute of anything I do. <laughs> a lot of what I'm, I do here is, is, is just that, a labor of love, so... I know I tend to be a popular uh, voice for people trying to sleep, <laughs> which is, I, you know, great. I think that's actually kind of flattering that uh, people would want to hear my voice as they drift off into uh, another dimension. Okay. I have a smaller ruler. I have like dozens of rulers. Where are they? So I can only work on today's episode for about four hours before I have to go pick my daughter up from school. So we'll see how much I can get done here before I gotta run. Time is flying by, and my, ideally I would get more than just my outlines and an imprimatur on here. But we'll see, it's, you know. I know there's lots of comments there in the chat. I'm going to get to them right now here. Oh, there's Ismo says hello all and Pascal there. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks Pascal for answering some questions. <laughs> Pascal says, uh, massive undertaking here today, Michael. Are you sure it's not a five-hour episode? Or it's, it's not a five, a five on the level of difficulty? I don't think it's as difficult as the Leonardo, but it is going to be difficult. I think it's this is more of a massive undertaking of time. 
So, you know, you can do simple things that require a lot of time, like mowing a lawn, for instance. You know, is, I mean, I guess it's physically difficult, but it's not, you know, you could probably train a monkey to, to push a lawnmower around. So it's not difficult, but it's, it's a lot of work, right? This is, this is difficult and a lot of work, but not like, uh, and, and no disrespect to Platillinelli over Leonardo, just that Leonardo's, the technique he used was so time consuming and so complicated, just the, the, the subtlety that he's going for. And it, and Platilla, you know, there's a lot of subtlety in hers, but not to that extreme. It's a different, different kind of painting, different approach to painting altogether. Asnel says, oh my goodness, that's a big piece. How many hours is you going to stand still and paint today? <laughs> uh, Isabel says, it's going to be an all-nighter. I Jess, just the Klesiosaurus. Uh, this is hi, Asnil says, I guess the next time we can tackle Bosch's Garden of Earthly Del Yeah. <laughs> um, I, there is a, we do have a Bosch painting coming up. I've, I've been putting him off for a while. It's not until, I think, July, so a few months from now. Um, and, but we're not going to be doing a f the full Garden of Earthly Delights. <laughs> At least I don't think so. I think, um, after this series of paintings, the Renaissance paintings, my goal is to try to find paintings that are a little bit more simple, a little less complicated, less time consuming, um, because I know not everyone's got, you know, dozens of hours that's probably going to take me to do this painting, right? Um, Jess says, do you use the carbon paper very often for master studies, or is it mainly due to the size of the piece? Pascal answers that yeah I think um, definitely I, I like to using this carbon paper for for all of these episodes so just like as Pascal says it can allow you to focus on the on the process of painting itself rather than on um, the drawing aspect now I, I did do an entire 45 episode introductory drawing course on YouTube that is extremely popular. It's just got like half a million views or some crazy thing. Um, so if you really want to learn how to draw, that would probably be um, a, a good place to start. Because, you know, if I was to try to sketch this out, it would, it would take me, you know, hours and hours to, to do. And while that might be interesting for some people to see, um... The one thing is, is if, if you're just learning how to paint, what I often find is, because I, I, I teach in-person classes, I teach uh, at a university here in Vancouver, and, um, and so I've, I've just seen hundreds of people paint, and there's a difference between, you can make a great painting from a technical point of view um, that is on top of a poorly executed drawing and that can uh, be very frustrating especially for a beginner painter and so if you can, you know, focus entirely on the painting process, not have to worry about the accuracy of your drawing, I think that will 
allow you to like I don't know I'm trying to give an analogy to to another like I don't know the first thing that comes to mind is like like a a cyclist learning and using a stationary bicycle okay see if this analogy works <laughs> I like using analogies to try to explain ideas in art um, so if you wanted to become like a professional um, uh, cyclist you know you might want to break things down into smaller um, you might you might want to isolate individual aspects of cycling so that you can focus on one at a time and get really good at each one of those kind of steps so for instance you may want to you know spend time just focusing on your on, on just the cycling like the the, the leg movements and then you may want to spend some time practicing the how to shift gears when and where. Which I know sounds kind of obvious, but actually, I remember I got a book from the library years ago um, called, I can't remember what it was called, but it was, it was about how to shift gears on your bicycle to the and the most effective way possible so that because there's there's it's kind of like a science knowing when to 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 shift up or down like when you're going approaching a hill or something or a turn and literally the difference between shifting at, at one time or another could be the difference between um, finishing in first place or last place, right? So especially when it comes to those, to, you know, um, like a, a championship where you're competing against the best cyclists in the world, right? So if we can isolate painting, okay, so here's, we're trying to bring it back to my initial, uh, the concept that is behind that analogy. Um, so if we can isolate painting from drawing, then we can focus on learning how to paint and, um, and then we can look, focus separately on learning how to draw. And then when we've gotten proficient at both, then we can do both together. We can combine them together. That's also kind of how artists used to learn, um, like painting. They used to work in like a apprentice master kind of system where the master, you might work in a studio of, with Leonardo, for instance, since we were talking about this just the other day. And you might, your first day or first year might be just learning how to to prime a canvas, get it set up, you know, stretching the canvas, sanding the canvas, applying gesso to the canvas, sanding the canvas, applying gesso to the canvas, sanding the canvas, because you, you can do that many times um, to get this, a smooth surface, like the, the prepping the canvas. I worked for a couple of hours doing that very same thing when I was, when I finished uh, graduate school. I just went to, I drove all the way out to Moore Park, which is I don't know, an hour northwest of Los Angeles, to the studio James Hayward, <laughs> this 
character. He's a, like a cowboy painter who makes abstract, gooey, drippy abstract paintings. He raises horses as this kind of ranch. And I would go out there and I'd, I'd cut the wood, glue and, and screw them all together and to build the canvases. Then I'd stretch canvas over top of those frames. And then I gessoed those canvases and sanded them down and again and again just to get these surfaces ready for him to paint on. And so I did that for, you know, a couple of years I worked for him doing that. You know, and we would, he would take me out for lunch and go and have a burrito. He, there was this Mexican restaurant in town that he really liked in in the in the city of Moore Park and we'd go and have lunch and he'd tell me stories and you know bless his heart I love James or Jimmy as people might call him um, but you know I also think part of the reason that he had me come all the way out there was was for company for friendship for to have somebody to talk to. I mean, there were there were days where <laughs> I drove all the way out there on a Saturday morning, expecting to work all day long. He just wanted just to sit around in his studio, drinking whiskey and just telling stories. Hey, and then he'd pay me a couple hundred bucks and send me on my way home. <laughs> like, hey, that's not a bad way to spend a day, just hanging out with a great artist hearing him tell stories about famous artists and that was like to me those are some of my favorite memories of all time but anyway you know in the master apprentice if I was to if I had stayed there working with him and let's say this is in a time before there were such things as art schools or academies you know I might work with him for five, ten years, starting from ground zero, like building those frames, stretching and sanding them, and then eventually big, okay, you know what, Michael, I think you're, you're good enough at what you're doing, I've actually hired, we've got a new kid here, We're gonna, I want you to train him how to do everything you've been doing, and now I'm going to get you to, to actually help me with the painting, you go, okay. And so then we would go, you know, while that other, I would train up that other person or um, Jimmy would help train that other person. And then I might go into a studio and help him mix paints. All right, so he would, you know, say, okay, today's painting, I want to have this pink and this purple and this green and this orange. And here's how to do it. And and then he would maybe go work on something else while I would be sitting there mixing that paint for him. And back in the day, it wasn't just like squeezing some paint out of a tube. It was more like being in a mad scientist laboratory where you're grinding pigments. You're like you're taking literally bugs grinding them up you're taking pieces of wood and burning them or pieces of charcoal and burning them or different pigments and burning them that's why you have something like burnt sienna and raw sienna right because that color changes when it's heated or 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 burnt And like burnt umber. Um, so that would be my, you know, I would be doing all these different kinds of, of chemistry uh, um, activities. And then, and then he'd come in and, and work on the painting. And I might watch him and then he'd be like, okay, see how I just did this? What I want you to do is I want you to make a copy of the painting I'm doing. I want you to make it right next to me. 
I want you just to see, f follow me step by step and try to do exactly what I'm doing. And so then, and you know, if he wanted a cup of coffee, I'd run and get a cup of coffee. If he spilled something on the floor or needed an errand run, I'd, I'd run that errand. But when I, I was done those tasks, I'd get back to painting. And every once in a while, he'd look over and go like, what are you doing? What? No, 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 no. Okay. And then you'd take a palette knife and just scrape all that paint that I've been probably working on for a week right off the canvas. He's like, no. See what I did here? You're doing it wrong. Do it like this. Stop cutting corners or stop being lazy. Stop, you know, you got to add 50% more of this. Aren't you watching? What What is wrong with you? <laughs> and, uh, and then I do it again and get better and better. And then eventually he would say, okay, it looks good. I think what you're ready to do now is you're ready to start some of my paintings. So, you know, maybe... He, I, he might sketch something out onto a canvas. And then he'd say, okay. What I want you to do now is add the first few layers of paint on here. And he might stand there and watch me do it. And then, you know, correcting anything along the way. And then he said, like, okay, good, 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 good. And then once he, the painting's gotten a little bit further down the road, he would take it off my easel, put it on his easel, and continue working on it and finish it. And then I might do that kind of thing for two or three years. And then eventually, slowly, each time, giving me more and more responsibility as he sees my ability growing. And... So I'm flipping up and down, looking at different areas and seeing, is there anything major missing, like a hand or a face? You know, like some of these, the details in the faces are mostly going to get lost. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of eyeballing to, to restore those features. Okay, I'll put that one aside, and I'm going to do this one, and then I'm going to focus on the backgrounds. Um, I'm going to turn this paper upside down. That way I, I can maximize how many of these lines get through. Okay, let me catch up. Um, Jess says, my painting experience is watercolor as a child, so this is all very new to me. Definitely. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think, in fact, I've said many times, I think watercolor is probably the most difficult and unforgiving art material of all time. And the great irony is that most of us, that's often the very first painting material we ever use um, because it's easy to clean. So our elementary preschool teachers love it because you can paint with it, it gets on your clothes and your hands. No problem, little soap and water, it all goes away. But if you really try to use it and master it, all of a sudden you're like, woo, that learning curve goes way up because watercolor you're just adding paint it's very hard to subtract or hide what you've done where acrylic is great for that because if you make a mistake you can just paint it white and and continue move on 
Uh, Sandra says, um, you should try one of, uh, Jess, you should try one of Michael's beginner classes. Some, yeah, there's definitely some much easier paintings that you can do. And um, I'll just, here in the, if you go to the Dropbox folder, Uh, that link is down below. You'll see the resources to get started. Oh, I don't think I showed where to find these templates. Okay. Ah, okay. So there is a link in the description below for the Dropbox folder. And if you click on that Dropbox folder, you'll see these resources at the very top. This is our art supply guide. So that's sort of what I was showing at the very beginning, the, the materials required. And then here's materials for our very beginner starting the master study series mixing the color wheel col learning about color temperature and value and then these next I don't know 50 or so uh, folders these are for um, these are all beginner episodes so any of these I think you could do if you're just starting some of them yeah are a little bit more difficult than others and you know, maybe like this, uh, the Warner Solomon Jesus here, which is a very famous painting, probably one of the most famous paintings of all time. The irony is that most people don't know who painted it, but if you've ever been to church uh, or a Christian church, you've probably seen this painting probably on the program or on the wall somewhere. Uh, very, very highly reproduced artwork. Um, anyway, so these are all ones that would be good for a beginner painter to do. So click through those folders, find something that you might like to to, to begin with. Um, oh, just as I'm working through the drawing classes at the moment, but I've definitely been thinking about what I want to try afterwards. <laughs> well, there you go. There's a whole new um, world after drawing that you can move into. ABCD says, I have a question for you. I love to draw, but honestly, sometimes I get exhausted and sometimes take a break but it lasts for way too long sometimes even months or weeks so my question is how do you keep yourself motivated and would staying away from drawing for a while affect the pace and improvement from earlier wow well great question great question um is it okay to take breaks absolutely 100 percent and not only that, I think you should take breaks. I think trying to, you know, learning anything is, is hard. And if you try to just do it all at once, you're, you're probably going to get exhausted and give up. And um, I think that would be a tragedy. That's one less voice that we would hear. Um, you know, art sometimes gets a bad rap. People sometimes think that, you know, artists are lazy or, um, but, you know, making paint, making a painting or a sculpture, playing a violin is, is physically, not only just like, um, it's physically exhausting. It's 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 demanding. You know, I think people th sometimes think about artists just sitting around making a painting as being, you know, really easy. But it can be like, you know, I I know this from when I teach classes that often people at the end of a class are like, oh my goodness, I'm just, I f like I can see people are literally like yawning, and I don't take that as like oh. This is super boring because people come back really excited the next class. Um, it's it's that it's it's hard work. It's like going to the gym and, and lifting weights for a couple of hours. So you know if you find yourself after doing any of these classes feeling like, oh my goodness, like my back hurts or my hands are tired or my eyes feel crossed, I just want to like lay down like. But I've just really been sitting at a chair for a few hours. It's because your brain is doing some tough work, let alone like, you know, it can be hard on your hands. And um, But as the more and more you do, 
the more you will start to develop muscles both in your like arms and legs and back and neck but also in your eyes and your brain your brain is also it's an organ it's there's it's a muscle and you know if you work it it's going to get tired it's going to want to take a break it's going to want to recharge and so um you know lots of artists talk about the importance of taking walks um, there's a great book i think it's is it by rebecca solnit who is one of my favorite authors rebecca's okay i gotta bring this up Okay, yes, this is I just love this book. It's called Wonderlust Wonderlust, A History of Walking. Must read. This is a great book. And Rebecca <clears throat> Rebecca Solnit is one of my favorite authors of all time. Really great. Um, and so this book is is you know about the importance of walking, going for a stroll with a friend or by yourself. And um, she, she goes through history and talks about how many of the greatest philosophers, artists, poets, writers, politicians, uh, inventors, physicists, mathematicians, you know, whether it be Leonardo or Einstein, you know, they came up with many of their best ideas while going on a walk and just getting out in the fresh air she talks about how the the rhythm of walking can kind of put the mind into kind of a bit of a meditative space Be, you know it's kind of you're because it's, it's very repetitive it's like a beat like a heartbeat right and so that it doesn't take a lot of you know, it doesn't take a lot of energy or brain power to walk. So having that kind of rhythm, kind of... And especially if you're going for a walk in no particular direction, as um, the French situationist artists uh, and writers like Guy Debord and Raoul Van Heim, um, who, you know, these are, the situationists were like a, an art and literature radical movement in the 1960s it kind of began in in, in uh, france but spread all around europe and and to a lesser extent north america but uh like Guy Debord, he, he famously wrote a book called society of the spectacle you know, was, um, talking about you know how we've become kind of addicted and manipulated by um, you know the news and and uh, movies and sporting events and uh, we're, we're addicted to the spectacle and those spectacles often have messages uh, that are encoded in them that manipulate us and reinforce certain kinds of systems of belief that um, you know make us good little citizens that follow all the rules and do what, what we're told to do Anyway, uh, the Situationists had a um, had a uh, what would you call it a technique or a I guess a, a, a technique, a method. They called the dérive. Um, 
I think it, it's kind of spelled like derive, but with an accent on the E. And um, the idea of the derive is to, it's kind of like an aimless wandering through the city. Although you could probably do it, well, uh, they do it through the city, but I'm sure you could probably do it through a forest as well. But I think what they like about the city is it's a way of sort of upending the the typical way one moves about the city, which is in a very usually productive manner, right? Getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And not stopping to smell the roses. And so Guy Debord and the Situationists were like, not only should you stop and smell the roses, but you should stop just going, um, stop walking with so much purpose and just start, just, just walk. Go in a direction you've never walked before, walk down a street you've never walked before. I mean, they would literally do things like take out a map and then trace, take a piece of tracing paper and trace on the tracing paper over top of the map your normal, you know, um, your normal route to, to work or to school or to your boyfriend's house or wherever to get groceries. Follow that. And so trace that route out onto a piece of, of carbon paper or, or tracing paper. And then, and then take the map and then you know, flip it over upside down or find a different map for a different city and then apply your path that you walk to work on over top of that same map or again, a different map, doesn't matter. And then try to follow that pathway uh, this 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 route that is now over top of a totally different landscape. Try to follow it, you know, and see where it takes you. And if it means you have to walk through someone's backyard or hop over a fence or cross some train tracks or scale a mountain, then do that. And make sure to stop in every pub and have a glass of wine as well. <laughs> because, of course, you know, if you're... You know, these are French and Italian authors, many of them. So you can't go on a, a, a good walk like that without a glass of wine to keep you warm. <laughs> uh, situationists were, were, you know... They were part of, they helped inspire the, the kind of revolution that happened in May 1968 in France, in which these sort of anarchist revolutionary groups almost took over the, the government. Like, the, they paralyzed the country for a month, and there was a feeling that... Um, they were pretty close to having toppled the the existing order. So just imagine if that had actually happened. If a bunch of revolutionaries in 1968 took over the French government. And it wasn't, you know, an armed military coup or anything. It was just, you know, like a bunch of students and teachers and but they did tap into the unionist movement and you know labor movements very interesting if you haven't read anything about uh, May 1968 I'm sure if you just google it you'll find lots of information and I'm sure some people watching right now may even remember 
things going on. May, may or may not remember what was happening in France at the time. You know, this is, you know, 1968. This is the Beatles and the Summer of Love. Uh, 68 is probably also the is it, uh, Rolling Stones and Altamont. Lots of... Lots of things in the air. Things were, were kind of wild. <laughs> this painting already looks pretty funny to my eyes. <clears throat> I mean, yes, it's super daunting looking at the road ahead here, but it's it, all of it's achievable. All it is is a little bit of time. And I know time is precious. But I think doing something like this is a great use of time. But then again, I am very biased. That's good enough. For that, let me just look in the chat here. How am I doing with time? 12.30. So I got up another two and a half hours before I gotta go. Pascaline's there. Yo, Pascalina. Hope everything's doing well. Exciting painting. Sandra says, oh, I went to Madrid last month and saw the real Bosch uh, earthly garden of earthly delights. Painting. I got to see the back too. That's so cool. Wow, I'm jealous. I've never seen that. I've never been. Oh, I have been to Madrid. I must have seen. That's in the Prado, isn't it? That's the, the Garden of Earthly Delights. I was only in Madrid for one day, though. So I might have been hustling around trying to see a few things. I must have seen it, but I probably just didn't have much time to look at it. I must have. I would have. I'm sure I would have made a point. It just doesn't seem to register in my mind. Hmm. That's weird. Okay. Just says that makes sense. I ordered some alcohol ink marker today and was thinking of getting some coloring books so I could use those to practice instead of having to draw something out each time. So, you know, one of the things you could do, Jess, is you could, yes, you could buy some coloring books. You could also download all of these templates from the Dropbox and color these in, right? And you got free coloring book. And, I mean, you could even use this same process that I'm doing here. Take a piece of sketchbook paper or poster paper, get some carbon paper. You can buy a pack of carbon paper for like 10 bucks for 100 sheets. It'll keep you busy for a long time. You won't ever use them all up because you can see how I can use the sheets over and over. And then you could, so you could draw them out and then you could color them in with those markers. And then you've got um, what might appear to be drawings that you've made, right? That you've colored in as opposed to just some generic coloring book you buy from a store, which is, you know, fine. But I'm just saying that I think... You know, if you're going to do it, might as well do something that you get to choose exactly the images you want. Because there's, I don't know, probably 400 different paintings that I've put made in that Dropbox folder. 
Johnny Rando says, I caught something live from the channel. Awesome. I'm so glad that you were able to connect. So as I got into this late and, uh, and know absolutely nothing about painting. Well, I'm your man, my friend. Johnny, check out some of the earlier um, introductory episodes from the Master Study series. That's There's a, a playlist down below that goes starts from episode one. And, you know, you, I would recommend you sort of watch the first five in order. But then you, once you've done that, you can pick them as a la carte, whichever one you want to do. Uh, Johnny says, could someone explain what Michael's doing with the pen now? And Sandra, thank you for answering, says he's using carbon paper underneath a printout and outlining the drawing onto the canvas. Oh, thank you. Uh, Sandra says, there's also the book Daily Rituals, How Artists Work, that talks about the importance of walking and artist practices over history. Um, where is, I have that book. I think it's probably back there somewhere. Yeah, great book. Um, another book I do have here. Um, Twyla Tharp's The Creative Habit as well. That's This is great. Um, uh, this has a whole bunch of different routines and things that artists have been using over time. Um, the, the Creative Routine, I think that's what it's called, is a book that has like um, sort of like each page is like a different description of a different routine by a famous artist like going literally to like what time they woke up to what time they had lunch what time they started drawing or writing whatever it might be um, ABCD says what what are some kind of exercises or simple artworks you do like when you get tired of doing complicated paintings or drawings in order to keep yourself in rhythm? Um, uh, well, you know, maybe you should watch my... I don't know if you've, if you've done the... The drawing course I did here on YouTube, again, there's like, I don't know, 500,000 people have done it. It seems to be pretty popular. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in almost every one of those episodes, I do a little bit of a warm-up drawing. So I might, you know, if we do... I, mean, I can't remember what warm-ups I did for each episode, but often at the beginning of every episode, I might do a five, ten-minute drawing. I might do, like, a picture of Donald Duck or Tintin or Mickey Mouse or something kind of fairly simple um, just to kind of get started and then use that as the launching point for a more complex drawing and, and lessons about, you know, a whole episode on drawing hands, for instance. So... I might start out with some very simple hand, like a Mickey Mouse hand, and then use that to kind of get started. So thinking of just like things that are are really simple drawings, where there's not a lot of detail, things that are going to look fine even if you get it quote-unquote wrong. So drawing like organic things like leaves, rocks, um, things that don't require a lot of symmetry, you know, like you might say, well, leaves are pretty symmetrical. Yeah, maybe. But it's also like, you know, you, if it's kind of crinkled and torn, you know, it doesn't matter if it's if it looks perfectly symmetrical, right? You can kind of have a little bit of fun drawing it. You could trace your hand on a page and then draw, you know, the, the, the various wrinkles and veins you see on there. You do that every day for a year. It would be interesting to see how your drawings get better and better to the point where probably eventually you'll be able to draw it without even having to trace your hand. You can just have your hand here and draw your hand next to it, right? ABCD says, you got a bunch of flags back there. Where exactly are you from? Well, I'm originally from Canada. I was born in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and my, my family heritage is 
Ukrainian, my father's side, and on my mother's side is Irish and English. So, uh, and then I spent a long time in in New York and Los Angeles uh, for college, and so what was it? that helps explain that American flag and lots of other flags of places I've gone to or want to go to. Um, so, yeah, okay. So this next step is is a next step. Okay. How how am I going to do this now? Let's So what I want to do now is you see both of these paintings on either side um lack the the background so here the center panel with jesus you know i can put this background in there um but i need this to kind of line up here and then i want that background to repeat so that if a if the paintings are put side by side that they'll they'll line up nicely together So again, technically, these paintings are would be more like this, with his shoulder coming, or his elbow being right here. But I have added a little gap, just so that each of these paintings can kind of exist a little bit on their own. So... This is the kind of thing I was thinking about last night trying to wrap my head around how I'm going to do this. I'm losing my mind. Why does that not line up? As an, I thought that we, I was like, this is going to be brilliant. Just solve the world's biggest problem. No, you haven't. Why does that... I mean, I guess each one of these I did draw separately, so they're not all technically... Oh no, so that's, okay. I just didn't cut this down far enough. Okay. There you are, genius. Okay, I think, I think this should work.
Okay, I think this should work. So the reason why I couldn't, I mean, I, I included these backgrounds in the templates, but the reason why I'm going to all this trouble to do this is because I would have no idea exactly how I would align these once I transfer them onto canvas, unless I paint, print it on one large piece of paper. So ideally... When I peel this off, or just look under here, Earth was a measuring. What? Where <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, I don't even understand. Um, I don't. How's my brain working? Okay, so.
So you can see it is a little bit different. So where I right now have this these kind of pillars right there, you can see that they're here. Okay, that's good. Let's do the other side now. Looks good, okay.
Okay, so there's a little bit of discrepancy here. That's okay, when I get closer to painting those in <clears throat> more accurately, I have these canvases all jammed up side by side. And that should help me get those in. So I just did the, all those kind of lines like that to make it as easy as possible for me to distinguish between all those other lines. Like maybe in another, it might be helpful to have like four copies of this instead of just the one so that you don't have all these distracting lines. <clears throat> but that's how you can learn from watching me, as you can see what I did and what worked and what didn't and basically just try to avoid making the same mistakes I did
Okay, let's, uh, I'm gonna zoom out. Let's see how accurate this works. <laughs> Pascal says, Patilinelli forgot chairs? What do you mean she forgot chairs? I mean, they're all sitting behind this table, so you can't really see. Probably there's a bench back there. You'll see here, what I'm about to do is sketch in the back side of this chair here. Pascal says you could also, you know, you could print on the other side. Of the, yeah, that's true. some food on that table there. So again, it's a little bit messy there. Obviously, we're going to paint over everything. But, um... Let's see. So this one, I think, is ready to go. The far right.
You know, one thing I probably should have done, if I was doing this really seriously, I would I would take these canvases and I would put them on a table and make sure that they are actually also square. I've noticed, I mean, these ones are pretty good. These, these ones I've got actually off of Amazon, I like, but I've noticed some of the ones from the dollar store are not necessarily always square. Sometimes they're a little bit oblong. They won't line up nicely, and so if we were to late set them all on the table, there might be little gaps in between them. So, the proper way to do this would be to really make sure that they sit nice and flush together, so that these lines, as they go across, are going to line up. I mean, if they're a little bit off, that's not going to bother me. In fact, one of the reasons why I've kind of extended these little spaces is that I have, um, I love these frames. I, I got these off of Amazon years ago, and I got dozens of these around my house. Um, I think the the page is, the, they're called, Artic they're, well, the manufacturer's the Articulate Gallery Triple Frame. And they're usually actually intended for like little kids' artwork, so um, they're made. They're, they're kind of. They're, you'd see that there's a little bit of space in between here, so that you could take a picture of your child. You know, they bring home from school, and you could slide them into these slots and have them on the walls. And then, as you um, your, your kid brings a different one home, then you can just slide another one in front of them, and you could literally have a big stack of artwork inside here and then each time getting replaced by new artworks but i love these for what we're doing uh, they don't as far as i know make ones that are uh landscape formatted but i might make one of these of my own for let's say a painting like this with even just these little i don't mind having these bars in between maybe maybe if i was to do it like literally specifically for this painting i would maybe try to omit these bars or make them really narrow i don't mind having like a a triptych in which there's slight little divisions because sometimes triptychs in fact throughout art history triptychs are very rarely budded abutted next to one another like this often they would be have little gaps when they're hung on the wall or they might be in like, uh, the, speaking of uh, Ronimus Bosch, the Garden of Earthly Delights, if I remember, it's, there's like hinges on either side, right? So the idea is that they can actually close completely up and then these doors open. Like, that's how a lot of altar pieces would be. Like, back in the day, you know, especially smaller churches, they might kind of put some of those things away, and then part of the, the ritual ceremony is, you know, you might have, like, the altar boys would carry out the altar and put it on the stage and unfold it, and that would be part of how the ceremony might begin. You know, again, every, every church is a little bit different. It has different um, rituals and routines, etc., but... Uh, Okay, I think we're ready to get these started. I just, I'm just before I do that, it's just this is once I peel that these uh, off, I'll never be able to get them to align again. So I'm just taking this extra minute just to make sure I'm not missing something egregious that is that I'm going to regret later. 
you know, nothing big, but just... You know, I want to try to be as faithful to her work as possible, within reason. Obviously, I'm not going to spend years on this as, as she, I'm sure, did. Because if you, like, th these figures are life-size. This is, tw in reality, 21 feet by six and a half feet tall. Like, this is a monumental artwork. 21 feet is, like, the length of a city bus, right? That's a, it's big. So, you know, you could imagine each one of, this is like seeing these 12 apostles and Jesus sitting side by, you know, side by side on a bus, right? It's, it's like, it's a huge artwork. Okay. Senga's there. Hi, Senga. Hi, Michael. How are you? Uh, how are you? Um, Ismo, are you painting tonight? <laughs> Sandra says, is that a monkey in the front dish? You know, I was when I was doing the outline for this, I was like, what on earth are we looking at here? Is it a monkey? I think it's probably maybe a, a pig. Maybe? Although that would have... Technically, you know, Jesus was Jewish. Do, do Jewish people eat pork? Ham? I don't know. Barbara says, uh, Oi, oi. Michael, remember, you only have 12 hours. <laughs> well, I today I have um, another... Just under two hours to work, so we're, I'm not going to do the whole thing. <laughs> ah, goodness. Okay, I think these are ready to go. Let's peel these off. Whatever small details I didn't trace, we will find them again later. Or we hope to find them later. <laughs> That's just going to clean my space up a little bit here. Personally, like, I, I find it very satisfying, too, before I move from, when I move from, like, one step to another, is just to kind of take a moment and just clean a little bit, get myself organized, um, because sometimes it can, if, at least, I don't know, just for me, if, if my workspace is kind of all cluttered and everything, it can, it, it confuses my mind, right, and uh, I don't want to be confused, I mean, sometimes it's fun to be a little bit, um, you know, a, a mystery, a, that's what I wrote part of my graduate thesis about it was all about the the importance of mystery in life and specifically in art but um, uh, I you know when you're making an artwork being confused can be can be confusing okay let's go to... Our next step now is to stain this painting with some color to get the painting started. And this technique is called the imprimatura. This is a technique that goes back even before the painters like Polita, Nelly. Excuse me. So this technique goes all the way back to even before the Renaissance, before people like Platila and Nelly. And it's, I mean, the imprimatura means the priming layer or the first layer of paint um, so here's you know some reasons why we might want to do this technique uh, it certainly was something I'm sure she would have done and most other artists of the period if not all did this technique and it was 
very popular for hundreds of years. I notice that very few artists teaching on YouTube show people this technique at all these days. But there's still, if you go to art school, you would learn this technique. And um, so here's a whole bunch of reasons why you might want to do that. Uh, let's just take a look at her painting. And let's just zoom in a little, see if we can see any signs of the under surface here. It is hard to see. Um, one thing is, so here's the entire painting as I've done, as I've kind of put it together in Photoshop. This is what the original painting looked like before it was restored. That's why I say you have to watch this documentary uh, that PBS produced uh, uh, all about Platillinelli um, because you see the restoration process that was involved and how massive of an undertaking it was. Like, unbelievable. Like, the painting was in terrible shape. Terrible shape. So not only do I think this painting is one of the great achievements in human history, in art history, of course, um, but the restoration of this painting is itself one of the greatest achievements in human history, I would say. I think it's rescued this painting from obscurity, rescued Politanelli from obscurity, and... Um, I think elevated her back to her rightful place as one of, I'd say, certainly one of the top five greatest painters of the Renaissance. And I would put her probably in the top 10 greatest artists of all time. Uh, once you, well, we'll look at some of her work here in a moment, but I just want to think about, yeah, Pascal says, an achievement in art restoration. Absolutely. I mean, there are parts of this painting that are almost completely gone like what it just you know so this painting was on display for centuries and largely forgotten and then it looks like probably it was taken off the stretcher and rolled <clears throat> and that rolling of the painting is what really destroyed this painting if you it's it's not recommended to roll any painting you know acrylic painting is a relatively flexible plastic film and you know it it will do pretty good if it's rolled but long term would be a very bad idea the painting could start sticking together and not lay flat ever again um but uh a oil painting oil painting when it dries forms kind of like an eggshell like surface like it becomes very brittle so just imagine trying to take an eggshell and to roll it like, I mean, it would just crumble into little pieces, right? So that's what happened to this painting by this great artist. And so, yeah, it's exactly like Pascal saying, this is a massive achievement in art restoration. I, I, my hands down, one of the greatest, if not the single greatest piece of restoration work in art history uh, altogether. So, but what this does tell me looking at this is, you know, all of this white, I imagine that might have been the original canvas surface, maybe. Maybe that's what the original, like, the, the, the bare canvas looked like. And then I'm thinking... This kind of fleshy tone, I think that's probably imprematura, maybe? It's hard to say. It's also possible that this white is literally uh, holes in the canvas. If you watch that documentary, you, I mean, literally, the, I, I keep saying literally, you can see that, like, the, that there, there are holes in the canvas 
especially on the edges. It's completely frayed out. So, you know, I would, in fact, probably, let me take that back. I would say probably that white is the, the surface, the, the new canvas or paper that it's been mounted on or bored. Um, and then the, I bet you this kind of flesh color is the, is basically like a canvas surface, right? You know, bit canvas like canvas bag. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'd be pretty confident that what we're looking at there is the is the surface of the canvas. Because probably when it was rolled, even the imprimatura would probably flake off as well. Like when you, if you watch that documentary, you can see that there's whole sections of this painting that that look like almost like collage, but what, the the paint is applied on the surface and, and you, so you can see that if it was rolled whole like hands probably fell right off the surface um, yeah so again just masterful job of restoring this painting Barbara says white canvas in 1568 yeah that's why I was saying as in retrospect, that's probably those those white areas were probably not the canvas. I think those are actual holes in the surface, in the in the like where the canvas is just pulled right through. Because sometimes, again, if if you imagine that that paint is applied on that surface when when it was rolled up and cracked, it's because of how brittle the paint was, it might have been both brittle but also adhered very strongly to the canvas and so instead of just the paint cracking and falling off the surface it it cracked and then tore the canvas away so that so that it and the canvas fell off the surface and you could imagine you know if this painting wasn't really cared for to the extent that it's rolled up you know, when pieces, you know, maybe it's sitting in storage and pieces fall off the ground. Somebody just every few days is just sweeping stuff up just as if it's like crumbs on the floor and throw it away. And uh, Okay. I think I'm still going to go. Yeah, I'm just yeah, let's let's do my I'm going to do my typical thing here. Um, I'm just, uh, was just wondering if I wanted to try to combine a couple of layers into one here. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. Now that, let's add just a bit more. Three canvases painting. One of the things, like when I teach in person at school, I have like a jar of this that I've mixed up. So I just take a big scoop of warm yellow put it into this jar with a airtight seal and then put some um, water in it about half and half a little bit more paint like you know 60% paint 40% water and then I just mix it up real good and I've always got that so that myself or my students can just go up they don't have to mix this paint like I'm doing each time I do this here on camera so that you can see me doing it. But if you wanted to prep a little jar like this of imprimatura, so you don't have to mix it all the time, then that's, I mean, that's literally exactly what I do, so. Uh, let's start with the center panel. Thank you. 
you know, I was when I go back, you know, so you know, this whole idea of prepping the canvas like this, this is something that I learned when I was, as I was telling that story earlier, when I was working for uh, this artist James Hayward down in Los Angeles, um, and I'd already, you know, I, I took art classes and. When, uh, this is when I was in graduate school, so I'd obviously spent some time and learned about like prepping the surface of the canvas. But it it, it really came to um, I really understood how important this is when I was working, you know, basically as an apprentice to an older artist. Um, the importance of of like just giving care and love and attention to this stage of a painting you know the stage of the painting where that most people never really see so therefore can really barely really appreciate but it's the it's something that as a creator I take a great deal of pride in and it just it helps sort of just you know I, I know if you can feel a little bit impatient just wanting to kind of get on with it let's just start painting but it, you know I feel like if I can get this right then the whole painting is, is starting on a really solid foundation Right? It's like a sense of pride and craftsmanship. You know, yeah, maybe no one's ever going to see this kind of thing. Um, but it's there. I mean, they, they are seeing it. They just, they're not aware that they're seeing it, I guess is the point. You know, it's like the same sort of thing, like, I don't know, if you're building a car or a watch. Maybe, like, you know, an old watch. Or really, any, even your phone, right? You may never open it up inside and look at all the cogs and springs and, you know, or... Um, but somebody spent a lot of time in those areas, and the, the more attention they spent on those unseen parts means that the stuff that you do see you know it, it makes the things on the surface function uh do what they're supposed to do right everything you know it's like maybe another example would be like on a on a movie like you don't see the the whole crew that's doing the lighting or the catering company that fed everybody or the, the the costume designer you never meet her or him uh, you never you never see the script supervisor or the casting director you know or the the key grip or the person running getting coffee for the director all of these like the editor all these unsung people behind the scenes who are doing a lot of heavy lifting you just see the movie like oh that was a great movie but without all of those important pieces being in place the movie just can't be made or it could be made but it could be much less quality even if you've got great actors and a great script without all those other people pulling their weight all fall apart and so for me this is really important I tend to also like the final you see I'm kind of going left and right I tend to with a painting I generally want my lines to be going vertically up and down so if this was a, a portrait painting I'd probably have those final brush strokes going down because often the light in your house or in a gallery is generally coming from above maybe a little bit from the sides uh, so if it's coming from above and if there is texture 
it's just going to kind of, those lines are going <clears> to, <throat> we might see them, but if, let's say if I paint horizontally and there's texture, then the those brush strokes are going to catch all of that light, and you'll see all of those stripes going right across. So even though if there's texture here, I'll, I, I might see a little bit of stripes if I look from the side, the way the light is hanging from the side. But anyway, that's again another um, technique I learned from James. In fact, his his sort of technique was a little bit different. It was a little bit more. Uh, he would do instead of vertically and, and horizontally, he would do diagonal brush strokes like this. That's that's what he taught me to apply gesso. And I, and I was like, and I remember like, well, why would you? I asked him all these same questions, questions that people ask me. Why would you do it that way? Well, then he would explain just what I just said there. I personally like doing this horizontal vertical when I'm applying the imprimatura, but often I do do those when I'm applying gesso in that kind of diamond shape pattern. Lisa says, Michael, I love your style. Oh, thank you, Lisa. That's so sweet of you to say. Thank you for being so generous. Um, what were... Um, Lisa says, I uh, just tuned in. How long is this going to take, roughly? <laughs> well, this is going to take probably... Well, like Pascal said, kind of in joking, like 12 hours. I'm not, I only have another probably hour before I got to... Uh, maybe an hour and 15 minutes before I got to pack up for the day to get my daughter from school. But... Um, so I was probably going to break this down into probably an, at least another two episodes, I would imagine. Maybe even three. Depending on how long each of those episodes are. You know, I mean, I could do one 12-hour episode and, and just crank these all three out, but uh, that's kind of exhausting. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, Barbara says, strap-in looks like an all-nighter, that's for sure. Um... Pascal says, the background study of the time of the artist, the artist, when it was painted, helps being in their shoe sandals when attempting the work. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, that's why I like doing, spending time, what we're going to talk about here in a moment, the, the biography of these artists. Like, because you know, sometimes a painting might take a long time. So learning about that artist and their life and the history, like you said, the time and place in which it was painted... When I'm working on one of these paintings, you know, there's lots of time to kind of meditate and think about, you know, what it would have been like for this person to work on this artwork, how difficult it was, or, you know, what they were up against, whether it was like, in her case, Platilinelli, like politics of being a woman trying to make art during the Renaissance was pretty complicated to say the least. Um, or, you know, like what was going on um, in terms of like conflicts, like there were wars and things going all the time, especially in Florence. Florence had been invaded a few times and, and was also invading other places. Senga says, learning from Michael is like going to art college, brilliant teacher in the community he created. This is so true. You guys are so sweet. Barbara says, there are some excellent easy paintings in the Master Study streams if you look at the playlist. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara says, I've mixed up a jar of black. So much easier. That's great. That's, that's smart if you mix up your own black and you've got that ready. I mean, obviously, you could just use black right from the tube. 
but as many of you know, I prefer to mix my own black, which we'll, we'll look at here shortly. I think I'm just going to, because I've got all of these wet paintings here, I'm going to blow dry this. Okay, very exciting. I, I will say one little thing that has me a little bit concerned is that um, the first panel that I put the um, Impanimatura on is slightly lighter than this one that has a little higher concentration of yellow pigment. It's it's probably almost invisible on the on your television or computer screen, but I can see it here. My hope and is that when I start putting paint over top of that, the the difference between this is going to be negligible. Um, I you know I could try putting another coat of this on here but then I'd probably want to dilute this a little bit more because then that this would make this now darker than this one and then that would make this one I'd have to do that and that and then this one might get even so that might end up having to do this one and this one gets dark and it becomes sort of this endless cycle of trying to get them all to to match and think it's going to be okay. How am I doing for time? <laughs> Pascal says, having a chat with ChatGBT, learning how to evaluate art. And I asked it to compare Platilinelli and Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper on seven criteria. Fascinating. Chat GPT, very smart. That sounds. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. How about maybe I'll do a little demonstration of that. Okay, let's put a bookmark there, Pascal, because maybe a lot of people watching this stream. I've never used ChatGPT before, and um, yeah, let's blow people's minds a little bit. I think let's let's talk about her biography, and then then we'll we'll do do that. That's great. Thanks for bringing that up, Pascal. That's why I love doing these. Is the the resources that you guys bring to these episodes is is incredible. Like our collective brain. Um, 
is so much more powerful than just us individually, right? And that's why I'm so grateful to be part of this community that has sprung up and so many smart, passionate people. We get to talk and share um, our passion for art together. Okay. Let's take a moment here to talk a little bit about the biography of Platilinelli or Sister Platilinelli and um, and her incredible contribution to art and why I think she's arguably one of the top 10 greatest artists of all time. And I think an argument could be made of her being probably the greatest female artist of all time. Um, which is saying something because there's we've covered a lot of great female artists over the past four years together um, and so yeah you tell me what you think I mean I think your brain is about to be completely melted here so um, just a quick little shout out to remind people to join the Facebook group next Wednesday we're doing our our bonus feedback episode so anything that's been posted here to the Facebook group I'm going to go through and I'm going to offer free feedback on that to help you grow and and become a better artist and I, I, I'll talk about the paintings that are there the drawings that you've posted if even if you're just starting the drawing course I want to help you get better so um Standing mat in order here. Okay, so Platilla Nelly is born in 1524 and passes away around 1588, age 63, 64 years old. So, as is typical of the period of time, we know a lot more about the male artists who were working during the Renaissance than art the very, very few female artists who were allowed to make art during the Renaissance. So we don't have as much information about her biography, her her the like the day that she was born or died in the same way that we, we know about I mean, even artists like Leonardo da Vinci you know, some of those details are a little bit foggy. Just because there was a different way that artists were appreciated back then. It was more about the art rather than the artists themselves. It's not really until Vasari wrote his book, The Lives of Artists. He was really the first biographer of, of artists. And that book that he wrote kind of had, you know, a, a chapter on many of the greatest artists of the time. And he, he also he wrote about Nelly in, in his book. Vasari wrote about um, Nelly, which is really saying something that she kind of broke through a glass ceiling there that, you know, uh, you're talking about uh, attitudes towards women that you know, today we would find just kind of mind-boggling, but um, so the fact that Vasari included uh, Platilla Nelly in his book of important artists, and he didn't, he didn't, you know, write certainly as much about her as he did about the other male artists, but it is significant that he mentioned her at all and tells us a little bit about how she was seen at the time. Um, and so and another, for instance, another thing that tells us how important and respected she was is when kind of like her closest mentor, Fra, Bart Fra, Bart Fra Bartolomo, um, when Fra Bartolomo, when Fra Bartolomo passed away, he gave her as, uh, all of his sketchbooks. So Bar Bartolomo was one of the great artists of the of the kind of the early Renaissance, or kind of 
um, I guess maybe high renaissance. And the fact that he gave her his sketchbooks, so the really probably, you know, most people, most artists consider the sketchbooks often to be the, the most personal possessions, right? Where their, their, their raw ideas are, 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 are wrestled with and jotted down and scribbled out. And, and so the fact that he gave her and not Michelangelo or Raphael or any of the other great artists, he gave that to her tells us how much he respected her how much he saw her as and her ability and talent um at a time where you know i mean we're talking about a time where women had no rights weren't considered human beings couldn't you know do virtually any of the things that men were allowed to do so for bartolomo to to treat her in that way is like i mean kind of unheard of like anyway like i mean you know i mean i haven't thought about who i would give my sketchbooks to um but whoever i probably would give them to my daughter right like you can think of like so i don't know if bartolomo i don't know that much about his biography if he had family or whatever but anyway that i just think that that is probably more significant than almost anything when you really think about that that you know for a teacher a master to give their kind of student their all of their journals is kind of mind-boggling anyway not to belabor the point but um so platilla nelly is born in florence and let's just um, just for the sake of of uh helping kind of place this in context all right let's go all the way back out to europe here you've got france and germany and italy if we scroll into here you see here here's rome and the vatican this is where um you know michelangelo's painting the sistine chapel alongside raphael painting the school of athens in, in the vatican so you have these two great masters working not side by side because they were kind of frenemies or or, or um, rivals, but um, that's happening and kind of at the same time all the way up here in Florence, which is also by the way close to where Da Vinci um, was from. You have, um, and so Florence was you know also where Michelangelo grew up. Um, you know, Florence was probably like the most cultured place, certainly in Italy, where the most, the more, most advanced thinking was going on, philosophy, painting, engineering, um, you know, you have Machiavelli sitting at the dinner table with Leonardo and Michelangelo, Galileo is there, um... Who else was at that table? Oh, there's, a, there's another really important person. Anyway, Florence, amazing, amazing place. If you've never been to the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, this should be, if you're watching this right now, should be should go up to your top of your bucket list. Uffizi Gallery's got, you know, masterpiece after masterpiece, including uh this here this michelangelo painting we did a few weeks ago which by the way is a round painting so if you're looking for this one and you can't find it it's 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 the r big round painting that everyone is standing in front of that i've turned into a, a rectangular painting <clears throat> um you know it is notable that when i i tried to search for her name in florence I wasn't able to find any locations, right? That that tells me a lot. Like often, like if I search for Leonardo da Vinci within Google Maps, not only will I find hundreds of places in the town of Vinci and in Florence and in Rome, like we're talking like bakeries and coffee shops, 
but there's also art galleries and museums and bookstores and you know uh, historical markers for birthplaces and where they died and the cemetery and all so on and so forth there'll be literally dozens of things that will pop up but when I put Platilla Nelly's name into Google Maps nothing shows up I think there was one thing in the Netherlands like a, a bookstore or something so that tells me kind of how she's how much or really how little she's res you know respected and um so again that's part of what i'm trying to do here is to try to really wake people up like i would love if because now platillanelli is kind of her her name is being restored to its rightful place in art history if 10 years from now 15 years from now i could go to florence with my daughter and we could somebody's done the research where we could find Platilinelli's birthplace where we could find you know uh where she uh, i don't know where she had lunch on the side of the Amo arno river or um at some point you know like i don't know just and it would be really nice if there was you know the the nelly's bookshop and nelly's pizza place and um, anyway, I, it's just things that I think about it would be kind of really nice to see. Uh, Jess is saying goodbye for for now. Thanks for checking in, Jess. Uh, you guys talking? Okay, let's stop. stay focused, Michael. Um, so let's go back to her biography. So she's born in Florence. Her father was a fabric merchant, and so came. she came from a fairly wealthy, upper-middle-class family. And that's one thing that allowed her the freedom to, to become an artist. So one of the things that would happen back in the day is, you know, if you were, if you were from a wealthy family... And you're a, and you're a man. Well, you've got endless options, right? You can sort of do whatever you want. And you, your parents would help kind of find you an apprenticeship in 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 whatever thing you might want to do. Generally, probably going into your father's business, perhaps. But if you really didn't want to do that, well, then your father would try to use his connection to find you a, a mentor, uh, like an artist, to study under. If you're a woman, well, unfortunately, your options were fairly narrow. If you if you didn't come from a wealthy family, well, your your goal would you, the, the your best outlook in life would be to find some guy, or probably you wouldn't even find some guy. Your parents and some guy would you would kind of meet and then there would be an agreement that you would marry this fellow that you've never met when you're like 13 14 years old right and um and then your life is is raising children which is you know a you know a blessing uh, and and I, I i love my daughter uh, but you know the there's virtually no freedom um, no real say in what your life would be and what you could do with it and where you could go and who could be your friends and all this kind of stuff. So I'm sure they tried to make the best of it, but I'm sure life for women back then was pretty lonely. Um, and so if you were from a, a wealthier family, that opened up more options. Not a lot more, but a little bit more and one of those options would be to become a nun and so because one thing is that these nuns were often kept quite separate from the general public they would be kind of in a in you know a nunnery like kind of a monastery like situation like a friar and um, you know, like in that in the documentary that I, I watched that I recommend again, I can't speak highly enough of it. You know, it talks about how she made most of these paintings have having 
very rarely ever seen another man, right? We're talking like that level of isolation that, you know, the only men that she would have really directly interacted with would have been, you know, maybe, you know, the, a cardinal or a priest who might come by, might maybe deliver a sermon on Sundays. Maybe if she, and maybe a couple of the other nuns were to go to, you know, a market and buy some fresh fruit. But for the most part, they were kind of isolated, separated from the rest of society. And there, there was one of the things that, that women in a convent like this would, um, would be given freedom to do things like make art. There, there was, you know, work by nuns, like, because there, there was a, a, a kind of a cottage industry of, of female painters who were painting kind of these devotional paintings, often like smaller paintings um, of like Christ on the cross, maybe even the Last Supper, and they'd generally be kind of smaller paintings, and those were kind of seen as, as, like almost divine relics, because these women who are kind of devoting their lives to the to the study of of Christian religion, thought, and um, are are kind of seen as as semi enlightened figures, and so to have an artwork by one of these women would be kind of a prized possession. So there were probably some minor painting classes that would have been offered to women in these monasteries. Again, her, her mentor, Fra Bar Bartolomo, uh, clearly worked with her to some extent. I'm not exactly sure you know, how close those interactions would have been because probably, you know, uh, just the, the 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 conditions of the time, you know, a single woman being with a single man that aren't married in the same room would be, you know, cause for some, um, you know, I'm sure there were probably some rumors would go around like, uh oh, Bartolomo's coming along and. Nellie, they're going in in the room and that she's learning from I'm sure there was some kind of spurious kind of things that would would have been said um, so you would in order to avoid that you might have instead of Nellie being by herself there might be four other nuns in the room and maybe a, a junior priest or friar kind of sitting in you know and maybe they're on the other sides of a of a gymnasium or something I, I'm not sure how how that whole you know I'd be interested to kind of see that that's why when I was you know you know I, I was I've been interested in her work for a while she's been on my radar of like a really interesting person great artist to explore but as I've been putting this episode together I'm like oh my goodness like I would you know I would love to watch like a a five episode Netflix series, you know, or, or a t five season long, you know, drama about her life. Maybe just working on this painting, you know, you could do this painting. It could, could take two, three seasons while she's painting it. And just the, the life in Florence at the time, the other artists and thinkers, the wars going on, like the politics, like, it would be fascinating and just from the point of view of a woman in that society and a, a woman who's kind of excelling beyond really pushing the gender boundaries or, or roles that, that were ascribed, prescribed at that time would, would I think be absolutely fascinating. So that's why one of the things I was doing as I'm you know, as I said, I watched this documentary. And I was standing in my living room last night, just like, 
Like, I don't know if I've ever watched a movie the movies got me so excited that I'm literally standing in the middle of the room watching the television. Because I was just like, wow, this is an incredible story. This needs to be, somebody's got to tell this story. So then I was thinking, like, okay, I, I should write some some tweets or something and to Steven Spielberg or, you know, and be like, you got to do something with this story. Somebody's got to tell this woman's story. And then I'm thinking, well, probably the f first thing people would, if I was to talk to Steven Spielberg, he'd be like, why should I do it? Well, if you're so excited about it, why don't you do it? And I'm like, man, maybe this should be my next big project. <laughs> Although I still got a, I'm still working on a biography of another artist, a comic book I've been working on for a few years. So I'm sure my editor and publisher hearing me talk was like, oh God, Michael, please finish the, finish the first thing before you start thinking about another project. Please, we're like, we wanted that book done years ago. So anyway, just I'm just talking about the level of excitement and fascination I, um, I and respect I feel towards this great artist. Um... You know, so she becomes a nun at the age of 14 years old. And um, the, the, the place that she's a student at is run by this n notorious fe fellow here, Savonarola. And Savonarola, I might have talked, I, I'm sure I would have talked about him when we did our episode on Botticelli years ago. Uh, Savonarola, uh, again, this, this guy would be like know an incredible figure to be in a, a television show like this is the kind of role that actors would dream of having because this guy was quite the character he he basically ran a um like a reign of terror kind of like uh robespierre did during the french revolution um he was this like a uh, religious figure who like you know have you seen the movie there will be blood with starring um paul dano and daniel day lewis savannah rolla kind of reminds me of the character played by paul dano this guy who kind of rides into town as this religious figure and um starts to rise to power and starts to become more and more influential and powerful to the point where everyone becomes terrified of this guy and are afraid of offending him because if because he then starts you know leading these kind of like witch trials and um condemning people and you know, one of the other artists that kind of fell under the spell of Savonarola was Botticelli. You know, Botticelli, who painted the famous um, uh, um, Venus emerging from the clamshell. Um, the the well, let me just let me see if there's a mention of Botticelli in here. No, um, just. You know, Botticelli, you know, here's from the birth of Venus, right? You've, I'm sure, seen this painting here. Um, let's see, just... Uh, right, here's, here's his two most famous paintings, the Primavera and the birth of Venus, right? So this, the, the crazy thing with Botticelli is he fell under the spell of Savonarola and become and became so enamored um, by, by by Savonarola's teaching that he destroyed the, the vast majority of his early work because he considered to be pagan heretical um, work. Because like painting the birth of Venus, you know, um, the, the Primavera, those are are like um, Greco-Roman myths, right? Stories. And so Savonarola is like, why are you painting these? That's heresy to paint, make paintings of gods that don't exist compared to our God who does exist. Like, you should destroy this work. And Botticelli's like, 
gosh, you're right. I What was I doing making paintings like the birth of Venus? I'm so ashamed. Oh my goodness, what have I done? So he destroys all of this art. We don't know how many great paintings Botticelli destroyed, but that's... So to kind of bring this back, Savonarola is the guy who's in charge of the place where she is living and working. So that's why I say when Fra Bartolomo is her her teacher, it's like, how how did that work? Because you're talking about like she's working and living under this like probably one of the most conservative religious figures of all time. So anything that challenged, you know, gender norms would have been per, like, like risking her life, literally. Right. So how that's why I'm saying somebody needs to, to there needs to be a film because the, the level of intrigue and drama that would have been going on behind the scenes of this whole st of her life story to me is just absolutely fascinating like it, it just it's got to be there's a there's a story here waiting to be told that is just got it mind-boggling um So, what do I want to say? Again, like, a lot of, I think we're, we're just now be kind of starting to learn a, more and more about her. I would suspect probably over the next decade, more information is going to emerge from various different kinds of of documents as historians become more and more interested in her life and we're because at the moment you know much of what we know about her is 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 small i mean it's not it's not it's not that we don't know anything about her but it's limited but i'm sure there is some documentary um evidence um somewhere because of again the 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 level of quality at which she's working made her impossible to ignore and she you know sp specifically with this painting which is nothing short of a absolute masterpiece and you know gain the respect of artists as i said like fra bartolomo giving her her his sketchbooks is just says i think as far as i'm concerned all i need to know about how significant of an artist she was and how respected she was and how because again Vasari wrote about her you know not a lot but he he did mention her which is you know not not insignificant so one of the things that um so there's let me just share with you is it so there's this group here, Advancing Women Artists, which is started by uh, this woman, Jane Fortune, who, uh, you know, a philanthropist who donated this money to set up this organization to um, to highlight art, often forgotten women from art history and to find their works to authenticate them and to restore them bring them back to their glory and then to um, help find exhibition venues for these works because a lot of you know a lot of work by female artists throughout history has either been lost or destroyed or you know by either deliberately by by men uh, or um have been you know like this today's painting rolled up in storage and got damaged and then thrown out because well, it's you know it's in poor condition and it's by a woman so you know just it's we were thinking of throwing this thing away let's let's use this as an excuse to get rid of it so i mean the fact that this painting survived at all is nothing short of amazing like one of the things you know so it was rolled up 
put in store so it was on display for about 300 years and then in the 1800s it was taken off the structure rolled up and then kind of disappeared and then it was in storage in Florence there was a, a huge flood in 1966 I think in Florence where the Arno River went like triple its normal height you can there's videos about this you can see you know news footage of this happening and you know it just it ran through Florence and destroyed tons of things and this was one of the paintings that was you know probably in a basement and got soaked and that you know if you thought rolling a canvas was bad a canvas that was rolled and then soaked with kind of muddy dirty water from a flood was just the you know nail in the coffin for this thing so i mean it's kind of remarkable that they they salvaged it and so what jane fortune did is she put her money towards helping to restore this painting and many others so this is a great organization and um i again they what you see in this documentary here is uh, all of these women, this isn't this, the whole project to restore this particular painting, The Last Supper by, by Platilinelli, was done entirely by, uh, by, by women, uh, historians, restorers, uh, um, and, you know, artists, like the whole crew was all female led, which I think is also great too, because Jane Fortune using her money to help um, give employment to all these all these women and to get them to work on this really important artwork by this really important woman um, and to kind of have a sense of, of participation and ownership in this kind of larger grand project it was super special like really inspiring especially as a as a father of a young girl like it just makes me so hopeful of like the the future that she's growing up in um that she will have opportunities that you know platilinelli never had or even opportunities that my own mother never had right like just to think about that's why i think i'm i think we're so lucky to live in the time we're living in now i know there's <clears throat> certain people who would like to to rewind the clock and make america great again uh by rolling back some of the advancements in society but i've frankly am, would not want to go back to where uh that fellow wants to go back to because i think that was you know i think anyway <clears throat> get off my soapbox about that but um so the restoration of this painting again I'm just going to bring the original back up here. You know, we've got, there's the original paint, or sorry, that, that's what the restored version looks like. This is what the painting looked like when it was salvaged from, uh, from storage. You can just see the, the condition it's in is just, and, you know, this is a pretty grainy photograph here watch that documentary and you'll get a, a very clear sense at that if you think this damage looks bad here watch the documentary and then you'll just be like how how did they how did they do this how did they bring this painting back from from the dead and turn it into this painting in which, you know, this, I think, becomes literally one of the greatest artworks ever made by a man or a woman. And, you know, it's interesting in the, in that documentary, they say, well, you know, maybe, yeah, some of these figures are a little bit clumsy, but we have to remember that she, you know, spent almost no time in her life having seen a man so we have to kind of kind of uh be a little bit more like she never saw the, they, one of the interviews she never really saw beards on a man so we can f we have to forgive her for some of the you know the quality of the way that the beard is painted 
And I was like, I'm watching the documentary. I'm standing in my living room. And I'm like, sorry, what? We don't need to make apologies for the way she painted these figures. These are exceptional, like, what? 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 Who are we comparing this to that we think these, there's something um, maybe uh, lesser than? <laughs> like, I don't, like, I, I look at this and just, I'm in awe, right? I'm, uh, you know, I was, you know, I had like this experience last night watching this of like that s sublime feeling of awe or, you know, in Christian um, circles, you might call it a gape, right? Of, of just, you know, a gape of, with love and, uh, and respect, fascination, awe, and sublime being kind of the same thing, but almost a little bit of terror of being just like, wow, that is, this is better than anything I could ever do for sure. And, and then kind of a, a bit of anger of like, why, why is this not, why is Pl Platila Nelly not, you know, literally on the tips of, of every child, especially young girls growing up, uh, and, you know, why, why do young girls not have posters of her work in their bedrooms? Like, why, you know, she should be a hero to all humans, um, boy and girl, but especially, anyway, I just, I, I'm, okay, let's look at some of her work here. Now, again, because of her position in, why was that up? Um, because of her position in uh, society, you know, she wasn't given as many opportunities as men to make art, but she did accomplish a lot. You know, I'm sure that this, the Last Supper probably would have taken her like at least a, two or three years to paint. Like this is a monumental achievement. And she might've probably also had help by other women, other nuns in the, the convent there. But I mean, like, look at, like, are you kidding me? Like this looks to me like a lot more like a Northern European um, artwork. Like just the kind of the facial features. Who does that remind me of? Just looks like a lot more like a, a Dutch painting, which is kind of odd because I don't think she ever traveled anywhere near. <clears throat> like, are you kidding? Like, look at the detail. Like, I don't know if all of this shows up on your computer screen. That's why you need to put your face right up to the screen here and look at it and see like look at all of these individual tiny little brush strokes <laughs> are you kidding me this is like a incredible achievement that's just incredible like i could just I could look at that all day long and just be completely bowled over. Um, and so this isn't even all of her works. So there's actually, there's more of them that for whatever reason aren't on display here. Uh, and, and even these images aren't all of the best quality. Let me just see. I mean, even these drawings are gorgeous. I mean, oh gosh. Like, this is another great painting here, this Annunciation. Right? 
if that rivals anything that any of the like this is I think this is better than Leonardo da Vinci's painting of Annunci Annunciation I would say for sure Like, so, I mean, that's one of the things, like, you, I would say, like, if you saw a painting like this, it's hard not to see it as being almost, like, divine. Like, that's why, you know, as much as female women were, were sort of uh, neglected and disrespected during this time, there was, paradoxically, ironically, on the other side of, like art by women when they achieve this level were almost seen as even more incredible than men almost like like the hand of god reaching through them to paint this also is by the way the last supper is one as far as i know one of the only paintings that she did that she signed that we know 100 percent that she painted um so she signed this here um platilla and then it says, pray for the paintress, which, um, uh, you know, is this idea of, um, of, like, again, this, that she is sort of doing the, she's like this conduit for God to paint directly through her hand uh, and that we're kind of praying for her to help her in that connection to, to maintain that the the radio signal there uh, it's um, yeah let me see so here th this is the the main woman who led the restoration project uh, Rosella Lari um, you can see her in the documentary talking about this, but just again, if we just look at the state of this painting in behind her, man, the work ahead. <laughs> like, look, just look how big it is, and how much work would have to be done just to fix any number of little things in here. And the work of a conservator has to be done very delicately all of the work a good conservator is doing work that is made it, it has to be able to actually be removed at at some point potentially in the future so that if the if that the stuff that that rosalera rosella lari painted on this surface maybe that over the years those pigments fade or deteriorate um, that those can be removed and that another conservator 100 years, 200 years from now can go back and redo all the work that she's done. So, you know, there's there's a level of, like, impermanence to her work that is, you know, commendable. Like, to, to imagine working on a painting and spending years of your life working on it knowing... And, and even hoping that at some point in the future, someone is going to literally remove everything you did off that surface and do the job again, right? It makes you, it's, that's very humbling to think about devoting that much time to something that uh, at some point will be, will be, removed right um you know that takes a lot of humility to like it's you know probably also why the majority of art conservators happen to be women right um because most men don't have can't keep their ego in in uh in control enough to think about making something that won't last forever Right, most men would be like, "Well, I don't want to make a painting if work on this if if someone is going to scrape it off all later." <laughs> so anyway, that's kudos to her for I think 
what she's done is really um, a, a major gift to to humanity, to to the people of the future, rescuing this work. Um, so again, there's great little documentaries here just showing the process. Like, look at this. Are you kidding me? Look at the damage here. This is, we got Jesus right there compared to the painting that we'll, that we'll see here in a moment. So yeah, that this looks to me like the imprimatur coming, or maybe, yeah, both with the, maybe the lighter stuff is the canvas, and this must be some imprimatur underneath. And not only was it rolled, it also looks like it was folded. Look at this fold going right through the middle of the canvas. How disrespectful. How could how could anybody having seen this painting on the wall have decide, you know what, let's take that off the wall and let's uh, let's fold it up, roll it up. Let's let's put something else up there in its place. <laughs> Just you know, the the sometimes you it's hard to even un, it's impossible to understand what is going on in the minds of some people who would who could do that kind of thing like as far as i'm concerned the people that did that were criminals like literally criminals to do that is like would you do that to you know any painting by any great male artist Absolutely not. You wouldn't roll up a, a Leonardo painting and fold it in half and put it in storage and let it get anywhere near the possibility of a major flood ruining it. Anyway, I digress. You can see that this kind of, I find this pretty upsetting. Now, I will say... You know, if you watch that PBS documentary, you can see this is the restored painting. Do they have a picture of where it? Okay, so you know, this is this might have been exactly where it was actually displayed up high on the wall, like this. And you know, in fairness, if you look at Leonardo's, um, Let's see if there's a picture. Okay, so here's what uh, Leonardo's Last Supper looks. You know, and, and so this was in the in this friary in Milan. This is literally where you know the the various different little monks and friars. This is where they would have their their lunch, their little cafeteria, right? There's a little doorway here. They would go in and out of the kitchen, and they'd sit here and eat their porridge, looking up at Leonardo's mural. And so, you know, it's, it wasn't uncommon for murals to be up a little bit higher, especially an image of Jesus. You want it to be a little bit higher so that you're looking up at it, right? That um, it's, it's, it sort of humbles you because, you know, you're not on his level. You're, he's above you, right? In his rightful place. Uh, and so... I get that they put her painting up here like this, but is there another photo of the room? I don't think so. If you watch that documentary, it's like, it's a great documentary. It's so inspiring. And then you see they put it up on this wall and then below it is like this display cabinet with some of the robes of some priests and maybe they're really Maybe it's their beautiful relics. I don't really know. But I was like, all of that, and then it's kind of up there, and it's it's not as if it's, you know, there's just this display case underneath, as if it's like in a shopping mall, and there's like, you know, some, uh, I don't know, uh, iPhones on display here, and there's this poster up above. It just seemed to me like... I guarantee you, in as Platilinelli gets more and more renowned, there that painting is going to be moved, and it's it, it 
even if it stays in the same place, they're going to have to get rid of that cabinet under... I find that, honestly, a little bit offensive. I find it like... It, again, it just... It can't help but read it through a particular lens of, of... Of a level of disrespect towards women. Right? It's like... You know, I, I, you know, you know. We look at here the the way that the Last Supper is displayed all by itself in this room. To be fair, you know, one of the remarkable things is is that during World, this is a this painting is made. Leonardo painted it on the wall. It's a it's a fresco or, or a mural, and so during World War II they they couldn't take the wall down, so they just covered it with like you know, five feet of sandbags and did everything. And a bomb, I think an American bomb, because Milan was under, uh, you know, the uh, Mussolini, the dictator's um, occupation, I guess you would say, of Italy. And so when the Americans bombed Milan, a bomb went right through the ceiling and landed right in the middle here, but did not explode. Had it exploded, it probably would have demolished this building and the Last Supper would have been lost forever. So talk about it like a miracle. But, you know, you can see this paint. So, so that's why so much of the rest of this space is just completely bare because whatever was there before was ab was obliterated. Like if you see photos... The fact was maybe a sir. Okay, here showing you... Here's the Last Supper underneath the scaffold here on the right. And then here's what the rest of this building looked like. Just completely demolished. Right? Again, just a miracle. An absolute miracle that it survived. But everything else was destroyed. So, you know, I get that this... You know, the reason why there isn't more things to see uh, of this Leonardo is because much of it was destroyed... But if you see, in fact, let's, I, I feel like I got to show you. Uh, let's see if we can find a photograph of this painting on display. Okay, here's, here we go. Okay, so the, you see what I'm talking about? So if you want to look at this painting, you have to stand here and you have to, to, to try to ignore the glow of these fluorescent lights to look at this masterpiece, which I consider to be one of the maybe top 20 greatest things ever made by a human being. Like, are you kidding me? What, that, that just seems to me a little bit offensive. I don't know. You, you tell me what you think in the comments below. But I just think... I, part of me wants to start a petition to get this s display case moved out of the way. All the display... You know, there's another display... So you can't even stand that far back to look at it because you bang into this other display case. That just seems insane. Um, like, another example, I think, of a great... Um, way of uh, Diego Rivera Sunday okay so this is one of my f another one of my favorite paintings of all time we, d we did a a um we did this, oops, as if you recall, maybe until, up until very recently, this was the longest I'd ever spent on one of these live stream paintings. And I really just painted these three figures in the front. This skeleton, Diego Rivera painting himself as a little boy, and Frida Kahlo standing in behind him. I think this took me like eight hours. I've since eclipsed that a few times with some nine, ten, and twelve hour long episodes. Um, but what is really nice, this is in Mexico City, 
and there's a this there's a museum dedicated really mostly to this painting and so this painting is in a large room and there's some benches in there and you can go in and you can stand and you can look at it and step back and there's there's a gallery upstairs that has some of the sketches that he used to make this and then another kind of gal gallery adjacent upstairs for like rotating exhibitions i really think that this that's how this painting should be displayed because it's hard not it's hard to really appreciate the quality of this painting when it's just kind of up there like that and again i know people will say well what about leonardo his is kind of up there too but it's also he painted it on the wall it's not like we can lower it and there's a reason it's a little bit higher but there's it's not like there's a bunch of junk well i shouldn't say junk but stuff a display cabinet right below it kind of impeding your vision anyway i want to get off my soap soapbox here okay senga says let's start a petition else I'll, I'll be the first one to sign it my friend absolutely Okay, I'm, I gotta leave in half an hour. I, I don't know if I can get anything done on this painting in half an hour to make it worthwhile starting right now so I think the best thing for me to do would be to pause or stop today's episode and then to pick up where I've left off here and start painting the background um, because really what I want to be able to do is paint uh, or at least get the first layer of the or a first pass through the background and foreground on all three paintings simultaneously so that they all have kind of matching backgrounds and foregrounds um, as opposed to just painting this one and then painting this one, and this painting this one, because the likelihood that those colors that I would mix the same, let's say browns on this paneling and behind, and the floor is zero, right? They're going to look all different, and then no matter how successful I feel about the way I painted everything else, I'm just going to be like, ah, but those ah, backgrounds drive me crazy that they're all, they don't connect nice and neatly together. So, as much as it pains me, I think it's best to stop here. Let me, I just want to go through some of these comments. Whoa, look at all the chat. Uh, okay, where do I even... Um, I'll read some of these comments here. I think where I left off. Barbara says, I'm new to painting as well. Uh, these master class streams with Michael are just awesome. If you look at the playlist, he did 40 classes on drawing and over 300 episodes on painting. Um, Sandra says, ask it what the animal is in the center of Plotilla's painting. Yes. Um... Pascal says, I, I did, I asked it earlier, it said roasted lamb was the typical main course at the time for this event. That makes so much sense. Okay, lamb. That That's probably what it is. Because I was thinking, you know, let's just look at this again. <coughs> if we're talking about this thing <coughs> in the dish, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> in front of Jesus here. 
like and I was like I have no idea what that is when I was sketching it out I, I initially kind of because it's you do tell me where you put the lines on here I'm like I started trying to draw like maybe a pig snout and I was like yeah but what if it's not a pig then it's so a lamb that looks kind of like a baby lamb I bet you that's what it is I'm a vegetarian by the way so <laughs> um but uh Senga says, it definitely looks like a pig, a monkey pig. Uh, other things on the plates were beans, olives, herbs, fish sauce, unleavened bread, dates, wine. But yeah, no monkey, and I doubt they would have had monkeys in the region. Well, maybe they had some in Parliament. <laughs> uh, Pascal says, Bartolomo. Uh, like the Simpsons. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm sure Bart is short for Bartolomo, for sure. Okay. Senga's doing two commissions on two big canvases. My biggest yet, but I'm also moving house. My goodness, you're busy. there. Sandra says, I've been on a painting break, hopefully trying to get back into it again. Well, Sandra, you are one of our great, uh, incredible, inspiring artists, so I do hope you uh, can get back in the studio and crank out some more masterpieces, because the stuff that, that you've shown us, that you've done up to this time, has been incredible definitely very popular with with the members on our in our community on the facebook group so kathy's um, a little bit busy today painting the salvatore mundi by leonardo da vinci still <coughs> trying to balance life garden family and my hobbies hey that painting the leonardo salvatore mundi that's a challenge hey don't uh you know, if it if it took you a, a week to paint that one or more, I, it, yeah, it, that one I, I did that one in like nine hours, and even then it felt incredibly rushed. That is way more difficult than I ever thought it would be. Um, oh, Sandra says I watched that yesterday. What a good episode, Michael. Thank you. Kathy says, uh, new philosophy, paint and enjoy and let some be just okay and some work on for longer. Depends on my mood and time. That's a really good way of approaching painting. You know, I think if you can make a painting and um, you can, uh, if it turns out, great. If it doesn't turn out, that's okay too. Uh, because I think the, the more that you can find joy in the process of painting, the more likely that the, the final result of that painting will be, be satisfactory. Not always. Sometimes I've worked on paintings and loved and had a great time, and at the end it's like, hmm, well, I don't know if I'm going to be hanging this one up anywhere anytime soon, but man, this is a lot of fun to make, right? And I think, the, you know, I think it, having fun and enjoying the painting process is way more important than making a good painting. You know, because if you're not going to, if you don't enjoy it, then you're probably not going to want to do it. And if you're going to work on a painting like this, that's going to take time uh, if you're not having fun while you're doing it, then it becomes like a chore and painful. And then that's slowly going to bleed out into the way um, one approaches painting in general. And it won't be very long before one gives up on painting altogether and is like, ugh, I'm going to do hang gliding or something. This painting stuff is just ridiculous. Oh. 
<laughs> Barbara says, Leonardo's one had a door cut in the middle of it. Jesus lost his feet. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I can't remember. I, I'm pretty sure the door was there when it was painting. But maybe they maybe they cut a door in it after it was done. I'm not sure. I'll maybe. I have to think about that. Um, I would surmise, like, if the door was there, it would make sense that Leonardo would have somehow tried to integrate that a little bit more into the painting. So maybe, maybe it was cut into after it's possible. I maybe maybe you know already. I um, Kathy says I agree, Michael. It'd be hard to ignore the bright light underneath Platillanelli's painting, The Last Supper, and you can't get up close to it. Barbara says, I agree with your comments, Michael. After all the restoration work, its display does not do it justice. I mean, it's like, um, Barbara said, I'd rather see this work than Monet's water lilies. Well, okay, so that's a great point. Like, let's also look at another um, work and how that was displayed. In the... Um, A l'orangerie. So, this, I think this is one of the coolest uh, dis museums in the world. The way that this painting, or these paintings are displayed is really like, it feels like you're on a spaceship, right? It's like, this is the, like the, one of the coolest rooms I've ever been in. And there's two of these oval-shaped rooms side by side. And both of them have these large paintings by Monet um, around the room. Like, you can see how big these are. These are uh, big paintings. So can you imagine how much different Platillanelli's Last Supper would be if it was displayed in this type of environment? Imagine it was... It doesn't have to be... I mean, I think it's incredible if it is on on our level, right? I think if, if it was, you know, maybe raised off the ground a little bit, um, I and maybe even tilted slightly, I don't know, perhaps, but... I think that would be an incredible experience to see her painting like that as opposed to high up on the wall above a display case with glowing fluorescent light underneath. Um, and, you know, in a brightly lit room with, like, natural light like this. Like, it, I think... Like, honestly... You know, when you when you walk into this, even if you don't like Monet, like Barbara says, I'd rather see, um, uh, you know, Platilla's painting over Monet's painting. But even if you're not the biggest Monet fan, you walk into this room and you're just like, oh, wow, this is incredible. Like a good ex exhibition space can really elevate an artwork and really make it really, really incredible. So, I think, yeah, they did a huge disservice. <laughs> yeah, people talking about Lolly. I, I haven't seen Lolly in a little bit. Uh, I wonder... Sometimes she pops in. Often I see Lolly pop in at the very end of an episode or even, like, the night of. I'm like, ah, I missed it! How did I miss it? So, okay... So, I think just because of where, we, where we're at in time here, um, I'm going to do a little wrap-up. So we're going to do a part two and maybe three and part 
four to this episode. It's going to take me a while to do. I'm not exactly sure when I'll be able to do that. Maybe, maybe tonight after my daughter goes to bed, I'll come back down here in the studio and paint until sunrise. Um, maybe not a good idea to spend that long painting, but we'll see. So if you want to support the channel with a small donation, you want to hit the like button, subscribe, and the notification button so you know when future episodes are coming. That would be great. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, consider leaving a dollar, five dollars, fifty million dollars through PayPal. Uh, you can do an e-transfer or send a check in the mail. If you want my email um, or to, to send an e-transfer or to contact me, my email's on the Facebook group down there below, as well as on my website. Those links are there, so you can go find them. I don't post them here because you wouldn't believe how much spam I already get from people who, who, who go to the trouble of finding my email. So if I post it on here, the, the Russian bots that are sometimes appear in the chat would have a field day. So I try to make it just that little bit more difficult for the computer uh, um, AI bots to, to get me. So... Um, thank you everyone for paint or well, listening, I guess, maybe drawing along with me, maybe, maybe painting or maybe even falling asleep while I'm, uh, chatting away here. And, uh, I look forward to working on this painting again with you guys very shortly. Um, uh, again, know that you're loved, appreciated. And you're doing the world a huge favor by your interest, investment in art, by expressing yourself creatively. You inspire your family and your community to also take that extra little bit of a leap to explore creative options for themselves. And I think if we were if we were living in a world where everyone had a creative outlet for their feelings, emotions, and thoughts and desires, we would live in a much more peaceful, happy place. And so that's part of my goal and why we're doing this here every week for years is to help spread the power of art across the globe. Have a wonderful evening, morning, noon, wherever you happen to be on our beautiful planet. We'll see you again very soon. Peace and love to all of you. Happy Easter. We'll see you again very soon. Good night, everybody.